the print of the cuff presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management corporate partner AU Small Finance Bank in alliance with Jindal Steel and Power Limited and Indraprastha Polo Hospitals airline partner SpiceJet the world is in turmoil and if you find that too drastic you can say the world the map the strategic map or the geo strategic map of the world is being redrawn and who better to explain to us what's going on what was anticipated what's a surprise and where are we likely to go from here and what should we do to head in the direction that should be ideal probably asia's topmost diplomat uh, one of the greatest thinkers on these affairs of our times kishore mehbubani from singapore i am so thrilled to have you on off the cuff my pleasure thank you for inviting me so kishore uh, give us a give us a drone's eye view <laughs> nobody should say bird's eye view now <laughs> you, the new determinant is the drone give us a drone's eye view of how the world is changing and has changed in the past few months well i think it's very important uh, to focus uh on what's happened uh, in the past few months but we have to do it against always against a larger backdrop also and the larger backdrop uh which hasn't changed by the way because you will hear a lot of noise from ukraine for the next few months maybe next few years but the larger backdrop the return of asia the return of china the return of india the return of south east asia all that is happening okay and we've had a few stumbles uh, we've had covid that stopped us for two years and now we have ukraine uh, that is going to be a problem maybe for a few months maybe for a few years but the overall long term trend uh, hasn't changed but nonetheless of course uh, ukraine has no doubt changed uh the course of history and certainly ukraine has been a big plus for the united states of america because it had two strategic competitors one is china one is russia and russia has been seriously weakened uh as a result of its flawed and uh, sadly uh you know illegal invasion uh of ukraine and then of course china too has been damaged uh by what's happened in ukraine in many different dimensions and i can tell you about those too so that suggests to me that you think that china is not happy about what's happened and china might actually be be irritated with putin <coughs> uh i'm not sure whether china is irritated by putin but there's no question uh that ukraine has been a setback for china on several counts uh, just give you some examples number 1 uh the priority of xi jinping in 2022 was to have a smooth succession to his third term in office which is unprecedented and and to accomplish that i think what china wanted was calm and stability domestically and globally and ukraine has been a major disruption by any standards number 2 the china's main strategic partner globally has been russia and russia is now weakened and wounded uh, as a result uh, of its invasion of ukraine and that surely is a setback for china but the third and fourth setbacks may be even more serious and the third one being that china was trying very hard to deal with united states and europe as two independent poles and that gives us more leverage but these two independent poles have now merged into one and there has been a regalvanization of western solidarity uh as a result of the russian invasion of ukraine and that's also a setback for china 
And fourthly, of course, you know, the Chinese have accumulated the largest number of foreign reserves of any country ever in human history. They have about $3.2 trillion in reserves. I think that's about the size of uh, uh, India's GNP, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It's more than India's GDP. It's, but, you know, if I make a, a top of the mind calculation, it's about twice as much as Russia's GNP. That's right, the reserves. Well, these reserves, which the Chinese thought were assets, even potentially bargaining chips with the vis a their strategic compacts the United States, have now become hostages to fortune. And the Chinese suddenly realized that all these assets, which took them years and years of hard work, you know, you know, millions of Chinese workers worked. 20 hours a day to earn the money, to export the products, to earn the dollars. And the U.S. Treasury can just take them away with a click of a switch, as it's they did with half the reserves of the Russian Central Bank. So all these, all these are very, I think, significant uh, negative developments that China now has to, to deal with. So I would say the last few months have not been good uh, for China. So if I may simplify it for non-scholars like me, what it means is that you lent me your money so you can't fight with me because yeah. you lent me my money, mm. it's no collateral and mm. if you fight with me, I will just keep your money, you do what you yeah. want. Yeah. That's what, that's the situation in which the US has got China now because China is among all countries of the world has been uh, funding American deficits. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's funny because when the Chinese started off, when they started buying U.S. Treasury bills, they thought that they would have a hold on the United States of America. And by the way, in, at the height of the 2008-2009 financial crisis, I know this, uh, the U.S. Treasury sent envoys to Beijing and said, please don't stop buying U.S. Treasury bills because if you stop buying U.S. Treasury bills, the markets will collapse further and you'll be in deeper trouble. And so the Chinese thought, oh, okay, you now rely on me to buy U.S. Treasury bills. Now you, I have some power over you. But they've discovered that that power is all gone. And that was that, it, it all disappeared, by the way when the United States initiated something called quantitative easing, QE. And essentially, the United States was printing more money to buy its own debt. Yeah. And so they, 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 could no, they, they no longer needed uh, China to buy its U.S. Treasury bills. So all the strategic hold that the, uh, China had, what was seen as a major asset, has now become a major liability for China. Because there was a time when this was also a factor of stability because mm. America had to worry the Chinese will stop buying their bonds. Yeah. And Chinese were to worry that if they started to sell American bonds or stop buying them, then yeah. the yuan would strengthen. And so their yeah. export economy will collapse. Now that is gone. That's completely gone. And so by the same time, you know, it's important to factor in one consideration here, which is that the Americans never think long term. Mm. Chinese think long term. So I have no doubt that the Chinese are now thinking very hard what they should do to reduce their reliance on the US dollar. And clearly, most people associate American power with the aircraft carriers, the F-35s, and all their military power. But actually, American power rests even more on the U.S. dollar. And the way that they have really weakened uh, Russia is partly through military means supporting Ukrainians, but actually much more powerfully through using the U.S. dollar as a weapon. But the danger about the weaponization of the U.S. dollar is that it has now created a global incentive for countries to move away from the U.S. dollar. And if the U.S. dollar, it won't happen soon, by the way, ever stops being the uh, global reserve currency, 
there'll be a massive drop in the standard of living of the American people because they can no longer print money to live beyond their means. And as you know, a French president, I think it was Giscard d'Estaing said that America had an exorbitant privilege. You know, for, for China to get US dollars, Chinese workers have to work very hard to produce products and then with the products they get US dollars. For America to get US dollars, they turn on the printing machines, right? Yeah. So therefore, therefore, it's very, very important for the United States to understand that it should actually now try to build up in, uh, uh, confidence in the US dollar rather than undermine it further. It's not an American interest to do that. So where do you see the Chinese going now? Chinese are not stupid. They don't do things in an anger or, uh, or on an impulse. Hmm. Well, uh, the, the, the biggest competitive advantage that China has as a country, and I'm not the one who says this, the, the man who documents this very well is Henry Kissinger, I think also a friend of yours, uh, in his book, which is called On China, where he says that the, the Chinese actually think long term. And they're always thinking about where they will be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. And the Chinese realize that the next 10 years are probably going to be the most difficult 10 years in China's history. Because as you know, as I document in my book, uh, As China One, which is behind my shoulder, it's when the world's number two power is about to overtake the world's number one power that you get a maximum amount of pressure coming down to the world's number two power. And, you know, all the indications are that if the Chinese keep growing, even at five, six percent, and U.S. keeps growing at two, three percent, at some point, 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't matter when, China will become the number one economy. And then, of course, the, everything changes. You know, it's one thing when you are number one, it's another thing when you're number two. And you know, the strange thing about the United States is that it's the world's freest country with the world's freest press. And you can say anything you want. But if you are an American politician and you say a simple fact, which most people will not dispute, that the United States could become the number two economy in the world, you're finished. You're toast. You can never speak in the, in the land of free speech about America becoming the number two country, which I think is unwise because as a friend of America, I think it's good for America to start thinking strategically how it preserves its global influence even after it becomes the number two economy in the world. So when you say these things, you get a big pushback, don't you? In America? Well, well the strange thing is that, you know, uh, I tend to speak to the I guess the more thoughtful Americans. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, the former Treasury Secretary, the former president of Harvard University, Professor Larry Summers, was asked in a Bloomberg news program, so it's on live TV, uh, which were the three best books he read in 2020. So he said, number one, Barack Obama's memoirs. Number two, a book by the Nobel laureate Angus Deaton, Number three, he said, uh, has China won by Kishore Mahubani? So people like Larry Summers, when you give them the arguments, they're persuaded by the reasoning. So there is still a thoughtful class of American intellectuals who are still good students of the Western Enlightenment and can see the logic of reasoning, can see the scientific evidence and can accept it. But the problem in the United States of America today is that experts are no longer trusted. Mm. And so as a result of that, 20 years ago, when you said you were from Harvard, people would say, wow, you're from Harvard. Now you go to the United States of America and you say you're from Harvard. They say, ah, you're not one of us. You know, so that's the danger. Uh, in the United States. So I think there's a, as you know, especially after the rise of Donald Trump, there's a very strong anti-intellectual tradition 
uh, developing in the United States of America, which I think is bad for the United States of America because the United States has always had the best universities, the best uh, uh, newspapers, the best think tanks, and now the best uh, anti-intellectual culture, which is the paradox. Well, I noticed these days this uh, Professor Mir Shaimar, if I pronounce mm. it correctly, mm. uh, who has a contrary view on the war in Ukraine, uh, he faces a lot more, a lot of attack, which is uncharacteristic in the American intelligence here. You're absolutely, you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and, and I think what's happened to John Mearsheimer is a perfect uh, example of what I call this anti-intellectual trend uh, in the United States of America, because if you say things that are politically unpopular, uh, in the past, the Americans would celebrate uh, dissenting opinions. Now the pressure on people like John Mearsheimer is absolutely phenomenal, even though what he's saying is absolutely correct. That when as NATO carried on its expansion, and if NATO had admitted Ukraine, it would have been clearly like planting a dagger close into the heart of Russia, right? That's obvious. And so to just to state that fact, which is true, he gets absolutely attacked uh, and no one listens to him, sadly, because at the end of the day, I think it'd be wiser for the United States and the West to acknowledge that Russia has got legitimate security concerns, security interests, all great powers do, right? And this is shown by the fact that a small country called Solomon Islands, which is so far away from the United States of America, when it decides to sign a defense agreement with China, the United States objects, see? Well, so, United States objects and the Australians, I think, have gone uh, nuts over this. Absolutely. And, and so on the one hand, the Australians are the one who are among the voci most vociferous critics of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which of course cannot be justified. But at the same time, when the Australians say that Russians have no reason to worry about NATO going to Ukraine, why, is, why are the Australians worried about Chinese coming to Solomon Islands? There is a, obviously a... Professor Jeff Sachs, by the way, at Columbia University, has pointed out the contradiction between what the, what the United States and Australia say in Ukraine and what they say uh, on Solomon Islands. You know, I was a student of philosophy, right? And there's a very simple rule in philosophy. If you say that no great power should have a sphere of influence, right? And that's an argument. Then you're right, logically, Russia should not have a sphere of influence. Similarly, America shouldn't have a sphere of influence. Right? It's logic. It's just pure, simple logic. So, and then if you, but then if you say that Russia, uh, America should have a sphere of influence, you're saying great power should have a sphere of influence and Russia should have a sphere of influence. But, you know, this is all simple Greek logic taught to us 2,400 years ago by the Greeks. And, and, and it is amazing that you have very sophisticated American minds today in the year 2022 that don't understand the rules of simple logic, Western logic that the Greeks taught us 2,400 years ago. Well, uh, hypocrisy is not new to geostrategic uh, affairs. Uh, yeah. Now, given that, uh, I take it that Russia has genuine security strategic concerns, particularly in its neighborhood. Uh, given the history of uh, the Soviet Union and how it unraveled, but even given that, has Putin, it can't justify Putin's invasion, as you said, but how has Putin erred so badly? And how bad do you think 
how badly do you th- see uh, do you see this ending for putin well i i there's there's no doubt that uh president putin clearly did not expect what happened you know when he sent those hundreds of tanks towards kiev i think uh, president putin clearly did so on the assumption that hey Ukrainians didn't fight when we took Crimea. Ukrainians didn't fight when we took Donbas. Okay, they won't fight if we try and take Kiev. But to his absolute surprise, and to be fair, to the absolute surprise of everybody, the Ukrainians have performed amazingly well uh, in fighting the Russian invasion. And to be fair also to Putin, a lot of it is due to Western weapons, or turkish weapons drones uh, stinger missiles javelin missiles but also frankly the ukraine war shows that western intelligence especially what they call the five eyes intelligence five eyes are usa uk canada australia new zealand this five eyes intelligence network is the best intelligence network and it is shown in the fact that they could tell precisely where the russian generals were and you know more russian generals have been killed in this war than any other war mm. and that shows you the precision of the intelligence delivered to snipers to a toll exactly where russian generals are they killed one more major general uh, days before we started we, we recorded this and also they came very close to also finding gerasimov there who's the chief of general staff uh, yeah. they missed him by just a little bit now uh, you said at some point as we were talking you said uh, that india and china or china and india uh, they go down they come up and then you said they've come up just explain to me a little bit about the upward journey that india and china have had and where do they stand right now also related to each other and why well you know it's very it's all fortunately is all in data <laughs> and you know in the year 1980 in purchasing power parity terms china's gnp was 10% of the united states by 2014 in purchasing power parity terms which some people think is a more uh, accurate measure of relative uh, economic weight by 2014 china's uh, gnp had become bigger than the united states in 30 40 in 34 years he went from 10% to 110% i mean that's amazing okay the future historians are marvel at this and again if you look at purchasing power parity terms the three top economies in the world number one is uh, china number two is united states number three is india so you know clearly uh, the return of china and india i think at this stage is uh, unstoppable and as you know uh shekhar i've written several books on this and at the end of the day up to the from the year 1 to the year 1820 for 1800 after the last 2000 years the two largest economies of the world were always those of china and india so it's only in the last 200 years that europe took off and north america took off So if you view the past 200 years of world history against the backdrop of the past 2000 years of world history uh, it's been a major historical uh, aberration so i think the 21st century undoubtedly will be the uh, asian century and you know when my book uh, my um, over my uh, left shoulder it, it's a free book uh, the asian 21st century it came out in january this year and the publisher german publisher springer expected about 10 to 20000 downloads uh for a book like this a free copies instead there have been 1.6 million downloads 1.6 million downloads in 90 countries in 3 months and and that to me is a signal that the whole world recognizes that the 21st century is going to be the asian century and and on this by the way and this is why the i i i speak as a friend of united states and the west i say that when you try to 
stop the return of China. They're not trying to stop the return of India. It's trying to try to trying to stop incoming tide. You can't do it. So the, the tide of history is just coming back. So that's that's King Canute revisited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you talked about the previous two thousand years and then two hundred last two hundred years. So would you then say that both India and China, in their different ways, got stopped uh, by colonialism, uh, India directly and China indirectly? Because as Amitabh Ghosh also explains in his book, the uh, British Hitler who used opium growing in India and then Indian soldiers uh, to fight the opium wars and force opium on the Chinese. Hmm. Well, I, I think it's because colonialism itself was a result of what I called, uh, you know, the Western Enlightenment, the Western Renaissance, the Western Industrial Revolution, and and the West just leapt ahead uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, intellectual and scientific uh, development, and so. That's how a very small portion of the world was able to colonize. I'm sure many future historians would be amazed that a hundred thousand Englishmen could colonize three hundred million Indians, including my ancestors, uh, so effortlessly. You know, and and they'll be stunned that this happened uh, in history. But that was clearly a major. Historical uh, aberration, and now we have all the evidence to show that when it comes to intellectual abilities, you know, if universities like Harvard and Yale did what they call a race-blind admission, okay, they they refuse to look at the races; they just look at the academic performance. You know what? Half of Harvard will be Chinese, half of Harvard will be Indian. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. And indeed, as you know, Asian Americans have now sued these universities and said you're discriminating against us. You know, you 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 you're saying it's not based on merit because, in theory, the great universities are supposed to admit their students on the basis of merit and not on the basis of their uh, ethnic uh, background and so on and so forth. But of course, to be fair to the universities, you also need a diversity. And so I agree with the universities when they try to ensure that there's a, some kind of uh, fair uh, ethnic balance. But it's very, very, but the, but the big point here is that Chinese and Indians, and by the way, other Asians can compete with Anybody in the world today, and 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 clearly, the enormous success of China and Indians, Chinese and Indians, not just in their own countries but overseas, uh, shows what their uh, uh, ca capacity is, and and so the, it is. There's almost absolutely no doubt that by the year 2050, the number one, number two economies once again will be China and India, and United States will be number three. Yeah. So you know, what I what I just said, yeah, right? If I said that to an American audience, they'd be absolutely shocked. Right. And and how do you deal with that shock? Because you've been called a Chinese. Have, have you been called a Chinese too yet? Uh, no, 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 not yet. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, the the an apologist. You know, you see, the thing is, the the more thoughtful Americans understand that what I'm trying to advocate for the United States of America is a more intelligent and more thoughtful strategy for managing the rise and return of China. And, and by the way, the rise and return uh, of Asia. And so the people who read my books uh, understand that uh, very well because at the end of the day, I mean, the biggest mistake the United States is making, and this is an insight given to me by uh, Henry Kissinger at a one-on-one -on -one lunch I had with him uh, in 2018. He said the biggest mistake the United States is making is to launch a geopolitical contest against China without working a long-term 
without working out a long-term strategy. So I'm actually advocating that the United States work out a long-term strategy, but a win-win strategy whereby the United States can still remain the most influential country in the world while becoming the number two economic power. So I'm not anti-American. I'm actually trying to help America achieve a better way of managing the return of China, India, and the other countries. So I have a question from a friend of mine, <clears throat> brilliant young man in India who set up a bank. And in five years, it's, it's one of the most successful banks, uh, AU Small Finance Bank. So it's MD and CEO is Sanjay Agarwal, who has two questions. So let me ask the first first because it takes, brings us back to India and China. He says in one of your past interviews, you have said India and China can choose to be friends. What do you think is it? What do you think is stopping them from doing so? And do you, don't you think it's too late for a reconciliation now? Too late for a what? Sorry. Too late for a reconciliation now. Uh, it's never too late for reconciliation. <laughs> Uh, I would say, frankly, uh, to quote your former Prime Minister, Man Mohan Singh, the sky is big enough for both China and India to grow and become very powerful. And I actually see the possibility. I know, I know in India today, there's a lot of anti-China sentiment. I'm acutely aware of that. But at the same time, uh, when it comes to thinking geopolitically, the biggest mistake you can make in geopolitics is to become emotional. You know, if you even look at your traditional thinkers, Cartelia and all that, any geopolitical thinker must be cunning and shrewd and work out their own long-term interests. And frankly, India today is in an unprecedented geopolitical sweet spot. Sweet spot. It's being courted by everybody. Tell me, name me one other country that is being courted by everybody. India is. By the United States, by Europe, by Russia, and as you know, when Wang Yi came recently, by China and by many countries in the world. So this, this India, therefore, has an unprecedented geopolitical opportunity today. And it's got to be very cunning and take advantage of it. And the best way to be cunning and to take advantage of it is to ensure you maintain good relations with everybody. Mm -hmm. And so nobody, everybody thinks, okay, I have an opportunity uh, with India. And of course, the hardest thing to do would be, of course, with, with, with China. But at the end of the day, as you know, going as far back as Zhou Enlai and Jawaharlal Nehru, and Deng Xiaoping and Rajiv Gandhi, Chinese leaders had proposed, even 50, 60 years ago, at the end of the day, the border settlement will depend more or less on the line of control you have today. There will be no major changes. So if in a sense, you already have a big fundamental argument, agreement, sorry, a big fundamental agreement that the final settlement, maybe minuscule changes here and there, will be more or less what the current situation is. So if you can reach an agreement on that broad principle, which the Chinese have proposed so long ago, the you, then, then, you, then you immediately remove the biggest uh, thorn in, in, in Sino-Indian relationship. And for both countries at the end of the day, you know, they're such big countries geographically that a few hundred square kilometers is not going, to not going to determine the future of China, of India. And in fact, as you know, when the Chinese negotiated with the Russians on their border, they were very generous. They gave away a tremendous amount of uh, land in, uh, to secure the agreement. So it is possible to secure agreements on these things. But of course, it's got to be part of an overall settlement where, where the Chinese can see that they will benefit from having a good relationship with India. 
So you you think that a settlement along the status quo is possible? Hmm. Absolutely. I have absolutely no doubt. And to me, it's very puzzling that until now, even though two major Chinese leaders, eh, Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, have proposed that at the end of the day, we'll have to accept the line of control. No major Indian leader has said that publicly. And I think it's important for India now to show this confidence to say, at the end of the day, it's going to be on the basis of the line of control. So and I'm once both sides agree to that principle, you take away the biggest thorn in the relationship. Right? But right now, you still have, in theory, a Chinese claim to Arunachal Pradesh, you know, and, and vice versa. And of course, in, you, 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 you keep face, you save your face, ah, I cannot give up my claim. Come on. Just acknowledge the principle that it will be the line. And everyone knows at the end of the day, that will be the agreement. Yeah, nobody can take any substantive uh, property from anybody. Nobody. And, and by the way, the China doesn't have any secret plan to invade and occupy India. <laughs> They'd be absolutely stupid <laughs> if they did no, that. In, and <laughs> India has no secret plan to invade and occupy China. So there is no fundamental difference, you know. So why are the Chinese sitting in Ladakh? Why did they come in two years ago and are refusing to go now? Yeah, I actually, I must say, I honestly don't know what happened on the ground over there. Uh, but, you know, there are all these local accidents that happen. Uh, but I suspect these local accidents, you know, it, I, I was a diplomat for 33 years. Yes. When you sit down and negotiate, you never say, hey, this point is so important to me, this point. You know, you say, okay, what are our larger interests? What, what, what is it you want from this agreement, your strategic goals? What is it I want? And then you look at the larger strategic goals and you try and make a fit. And when, you're, when your larger strategic goals fit, then you say, okay, this piece of land, I give you this piece of land. That's what happens. But to just focus on a few square kilometers and say those few square kilometers are absolutely fundamental, that's not how countries work, right? That's not how negotiations work. And, and, and that's how, as you know, uh, major agreements are, are made. You go to the highest uh, uh, possible level and you look at, I'll give you a simple example, okay? When Nixon carry, and Kissinger carried out the historic reconciliation uh, with China during the Cold War in 1971, 51 years ago, they look at the big picture. Okay. I'm worried about the Soviet Union. This is my concern. China says, I'm worried about the Soviet Union. Okay, we agree. What are the obstacles? Taiwan. Okay, let's settle on Taiwan. These are the parameters, right? And so they work out agreement. But first you have to agree. You have a fundamental uh, interest to work together and, and then everything else fits into place. Yeah. And, it can, and, and, it, and it can be done. At the end of the day, India can become, in my view, India can become the number one and the most influential great power in the world today. And how, how, do, how do you see that happening? Well, very simple, because everybody is courting India. You know, I just wrote a piece in the Singapore Straits Times saying that India should become the country that proposes some kind of compromise solution uh, on Ukraine because India is the only major power that is trusted by Washington, D.C. and is trusted by Moscow. And the reason why India should do that is because then, frankly, everybody will say, this is the country we need as a global leader and therefore let's make India immediately a member, permanent member of the UN Security Council. And since I was ambassador to the UN for over 10 years, if you have a resolution in the UN General Assembly co-sponsored by Washington DC and Moscow saying India should become a permanent member 
of the UN Security Council, you will get the votes in the General Assembly and you will get the votes in the Security Council. And so you will have, in India, it shouldn't wait for other countries in the world to be admitted as permanent members. There should be a shortcut process uh, for India uh, to do it. And, you know, by the way, these things can be managed. And so this, this is India's opportunity to, to sh- take a shortcut route and become the sixth permanent member of the UN Security Council. Well, I suppose if, if Qatar can get uh, the FIFA World Cup, it <laughs> should yes. be a challenge for India to get <laughs> permanent yes. membership of Security Council. Now, uh, a connected question to what we were dis- discussing just now from Ram Krishna Prayat who is Associate Vice President uh, at Jindal Steel and Power. Uh, how do you assess, he says, India's diplomacy? Has, would you say it's been flawless in the context of Russia-Ukraine con- context? Are they doing something wrong? Could they have done better? Or do you think this is about as good as it gets? Well, I would say that India has actually done a very, very good job uh, on Ukraine. I, I watched a few of the interviews uh, with uh, Dr. Jai Shankar, uh, whom I actually know because, you know, as you know, he used to be the uh, Indian High Commissioner. And also, you know, he invited me to give a lecture uh, named after his father uh, in India. It's a great honor. So I know him. And I thought that he gave very good, thoughtful responses. Uh, I'll give you an example when some Western media were giving him a hard time saying, why is India buying uh, Russian energy supplies? His reply was that what India buys in a month, Europe buys in one afternoon. I mean, it's absolutely hypocritical of the West to criticize India for buying Russian energy supplies, right? And so he answered it uh, very well. And I'm told that when some American journalists said, oh, they have concerns about the human rights uh, situation in India, he replied, well, India has got some concerns about the human rights situation in the United States too. And I thought that's a very fair uh, reply. So but I think that's, see, that's exactly what the world needs. The world needs a truly independent poll that can then everyone can rely upon and say, this is the country that is completely independent, unbiased, unprejudiced, and this is the country that can try and make peace in Ukraine. And by the way, I want to emphasize very quickly an important point. Peace in Ukraine is not impossible because Henry Kissinger, in a 2014 Washington Post article, laid out three points, which at the end of the day will become the key elements of a peace solution in Ukraine. Point number one, the Ukrainian people should be free to choose their own form of government, free to choose any association they want, like the European Union. Point number two, Ukraine will not join NATO, right? And point number three, the eastern and western sides uh, should have reconciliation. And and for example, it was a big mistake of the Ukrainian government, as you know, uh, I don't know, when seven, eight years ago to ban the use of Russian. Uh, in Ukraine, and that's that's what I, I know. Sri Lanka, as you know, yes. went through twenty years of civil war because <laughs> some, <laughs> some Sinhalese politicians cancelled the use of Tamil. Right. So, in the same way, Ukraine made the same mistake by by disallowing the use of Russian, and that that's unwise. So Kissinger said, "No, no, there must be a historic reconciliation." between the East and the West. So the elements of an agreement for Ukraine are not hard to find. And so we, what we need is someone strong enough to do it. And I think India can do it. Sudhir so Nayak, who is one of our subscribers, he says, if you were to go back five years, China had good relations with Australia, EU, and even Japan and India. Uh, today, we see deterioration with all of these. Is this by design? Uh, is China doing something about it or do you think they don't care? Well, I think you have to uh, look at the case by case for each one. I think in the case of India, future historians will say that an accident happened, uh, I think in Galwan, right? Right. 
that uh, caused this problem. In the case of Australia, I've just finished writing a 5,000 word essay uh, on Australia and Asia, in which I say that the Australians don't understand that you don't insult countries in publicly. And as you know, when the Australians call publicly for an inquiry into where the virus came, most Asian countries wouldn't do this. You want to ask something like that, ask it privately. Don't insult the country publicly. Now, Japan and China have had a troubled relationship going back to the time when Japan, as you know, uh, fought a war with China for almost 50 years from 1895 to 1945. But there's a, there's a Harvard scholar, Ezra Vogel, that points out that, uh, that China and Japan are the two countries with the longest recorded history of 1,500 years. And for most of the 1,500 years, they were at peace with each other. So he says they can, they can live in peace with each other. It's a quite adjustment. So I, I think China and Japan will come to some kind of adjustment based on 1,500 years of history in the same way that China and Vietnam, I think, can also live in peace with each other. But of course, the European Union itself is, uh, uh, is, is, is a region that uh, is now completely torn about where its future lies. You know? And the European Union doesn't have any good long-term strategic plan about where it is going to be in the Asian century. Again, speaking as a friend of uh, Europe, Europe's biggest nightmare 50 years from now is not Russia, is not China. You know that Africa's population, Shekhar, in 1950, Africa's population was half that of Europe's. Today, Africa's population is more than double that of Europe. By 2100, Africa's population will be 10 times the size of Europe. So Europe's long-term challenge is going to come from Africa. And, and, and if Europe doesn't export jobs to Africa, Africa will export Africans to Europe. They're so close. So therefore, it is in Europe's strategic interest to focus on Africa, on the development of Africa. And here, the investments made by Asian countries by Japan, India, China, in Africa, is actually helping Europe. But Europe has not sent a thank you note to Japan, India, and China for investing in Africa. Yeah. So do you th would you say, would you agree with the notion that Europe is today, Europeans are a lazy power? Uh, you said the Americans don't think in the long term, they act maybe uh, immediately. Chinese act in the long term, where do you put the Europeans? Well, in theory, the Europeans represent the, you know, the, some of the most savvy, sophisticated societies, but they have actually lost the art of thinking strategically over the long term. So, for example, you know, the Europeans were absolutely spineless and cowardly when they caved into the neocons of the Bush administration and agreed to the NATO statement in 2008, 14 years ago, saying that the door is open for Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO. That was a highly irresponsible statement designed to anger uh, you know, Russia and they didn't even think about it, right? So that's an example of European cowardice and lack of European thinking. And it's very sad because, frankly, the Europeans could have easily reached an agreement with Russia to say, okay, we will not uh, bring Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. We will not put the dagger of NATO close to your heart. Let's work out a long-term deal. And unfortunately, I think the Europeans themselves should consider what mistakes they have made. And Professor, by the way, the expert on this is Professor John Mearsheimer, you know, I whom you mentioned earlier. And John Mearsheimer has documented very, very clearly 
how cynical the Europeans were because they knew that they were not going to bring Ukraine in, but just for political opportunism, went along with the neocons of the Bush administration. And today, what the, the price that the Europeans are paying is a price that they're paying for their political cowardice in 2008. That's a very important point. Now, a young colleague of mine, Pia Krishnan Kuti, uh, she says in a piece for foreign policy on 24th March, titled Washington's Russia Policy Bond Bulk in Asia, you wrote, you wrote of the importance of geopolitical pragmatism. In that vein, what do you make of the US sending officials like Deputy NSA Dilip Singh to New Delhi and raising the threat of war consequences, bad consequences? Should India increase Russian energy purchases? Well, I would say that it's very unwise for the United States to threaten India. Really, really. Because at the end of the day, the people, the government of India has to look after the people of India. And as you know, uh, the United States, when the United States is faced with a similar situation, I mean, I'll give you an example, right? When they want to, when they're corn farmers, right? Uh, want to get more revenue, they subsidize yeah. the farmers and you know, let them produce ethanol and all that. And guess what? The rest of the world suffers, right? American subsidies of Russian, corn, of American corn farmers raises corn prices that makes African people suffer, right? You can see the connections, right? Because in Africa, it's a staple. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So America does things and doesn't look at the implications for others. So it's not, of course, the Indian government's responsibility is to look after the Indian people. And by the way, the reason why we are having inflation in 2022 is because the US Fed has done a bad job in taming inflation. Now, what's happened in Sri Lanka is only the start. There will be many more demonstrations in many third world countries as a result of inflation. Where is that inflation coming from? And this is another reason why I frankly, I think India should peace, push, push for peace in Ukraine because the longer that the Ukraine war lasts, the higher the energy prices will remain and then there'll be more countries having getting demonstrations in there. So the ripple effects, I mean, everybody keeps talking about the suffering of about the people in Ukraine, which is terrible, they're, but there are 45 million people in Ukraine. At the same time, as the UN Secretary General has said, there are 1.7 billion people whose poverty has increased as a result of the war in Ukraine. So it's very unwise for the United States to threaten India when India tries to protect its people by getting access to cheap energy sources. That's, that's a, that, in fact, that's the responsibility of the Indian government. Yeah, I, th I think that was particularly, I, I'm not quite sure uh, people would have been pleased with what he said, how he spoke in India, and I don't buy into the conspiracy theory that he was deliberately set to say those things. So they made a, they made a, so they used somebody of Indian origin to say rude things to. Well, there, there's something in, in diplomacy called the good cop, bad cop routine. <laughs> well. <laughs> so, yeah. so I don't, I don't know whether he's a Sardarji or not. So they assign a Sardarji. Well, I mean, well, he comes from that. Uh, yes, he uh, yeah. comes from a Sikh family. Yes. Yeah. My young colleague, Sujit Veer Singh, uh, and I think we are, uh, we'll let you go because I know what time it is in Singapore now. It's fine. No problem. Very disciplined in Singapore. 
सुचेत वीर सिंह वॉट सुनो हाउ डू यू असेस चाइना रशिया रिलेशन से रिलेशनशिप सिंस द वॉर स्टार्टेड इन यूक्रेन हैज चाइना हैज इट रिमेन द सेम और हैज हैज देर बिन सम मैन्यूवरिंग so i think one thing that uh, friends of china have discovered is that if you are a friend of china the chinese don't easily abandon you and the country that knows this best by the way is india's neighbor pakistan right but so during the cold war at Brazil, cost at our cost <laughs> yeah 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 of course at your cost to you too but we are just giving you as an example that during the cold war the united states courted pakistan as you know and actually threatened india uh, after india invaded bangladesh uh, and so the, the pakistanis thought we washington dc loves us but the day after the cold war ended boom pakistan was dropped and then 911 happened pakistan was picked up and then when that was over pakistan was dropped you know so there there there, there are two kinds of great powers in the world and with the united states you got to be relevant if you're relevant yesterday you're irrelevant today you got to be relevant today the chinese have a policy of being quite consistent so in and i'm sure the russians have found that China will not by the way and uh, this is very clear China is not going to violate american sanctions on russia because it doesn't want sanctions on china by the same time for obvious geopolitical geostrategic reasons uh china cannot allow russia to collapse so if russia appears as though it's going to collapse china will be there china will be there one way or another So the Russians. That's why. That's why Putin uh, went to see President Xi in February, and and because the 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 Chinese know that if Russia collapses, the United States will just focus hundred percent on China. But can the Chinese prevent the Russian collapse? Uh, I think they can. They definitely can. They have the resources. And how would they do it? Well, I think in all kinds of ways, increasing trade, increasing support, buying the energy supplies. They will, they will, they will, they will make sure that uh, Russia doesn't uh, collapse. I'm pretty sure that they won't. They won't say so. Yeah. They will never. They will never ever say so. But they have the the resources to do it. I mean, still, they still have three point two trillion dollars. in reserves which are hostages to to fortune and uh and at the end of the day russia is a country with great economic potential and if there is a natural match in terms of complementary economic strengths you know chinese have got this tremendous infrastructure building capability the russians have this tremendous energy resources the chinese build the infrastructure the russians send the energy chinese convert the energy to global exports and then the global exports let help enable the global economy to grow so there are many natural complementarities that can take place so hypothetical question today but you know there are moments when it doesn't look so hypothetical if the russians were to use any kind of nuclear or chemical weapon nuclear uh how would the chinese react uh, i think the chinese would not be happy with that because the chinese as you know uh haven't fought a major war in 40 years right and the chinese uh believe that the best way to win a war is to win it without fighting and so the chinese actually they have to accumulate uh, very strong military capabilities because they are being threatened by the united states no question but they chinese will try to avoid fighting major wars and instead rely on their economic growth and strength so if there's one country that actually wants a peaceful world 
it is China. Because the Chinese know today in a level playing field, and when there's peace, the Chinese economy will outperform any other economy. So therefore, if there's a, if there's a shift to a more dangerous military conflicts world, that doesn't serve Chinese interests. And I would say it doesn't, it doesn't even serve India's interests because India, like China, also has a magnificent economic opportunity uh, to become uh, the, the second most powerful economy in the world. But it, it's, it's just as an aside, I know this is a very provocative thing to say. The first thing India should do is join the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. RCEP. RCEP. And why do you think it was an it, error not to join it? Huh? Why do you think it was an error not to join it? Because at the end of the day, uh, the big lesson the East Asian countries have learned, and you know, by the way, the East Asian countries, as you know, have outperformed everybody else. Let's be clear about that. I'll give you, I'll give you one statistic that will surprise many in India. In the year 2000, Japan's economy was eight times the size of ASEAN. Eight times. By 2020, it was 1.5 times larger. By 2030, ASEAN is going to become bigger than Japan. How did ASEAN do this? ASEAN has done this by signing free trade agreements in East Asia. And as you know, there's so many, India has so many friends in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's got Singapore as a friend, Australia as a friend, Japan as a friend, South Korea as a friend, New Zealand as a friend, yo, and Indonesia as a friend. Why, why are you frightened? Because it's not quite an India is apprehensive of China. Yes, of course, but there are ways and means of managing it. And Chinese competition will be there whether you're inside RCEP or outside RCEP. And by the way, the laws of economics are very, very clear. When you join RCEP, even if you lose bilaterally with China, you gain multilaterally with the rest because this is the world's largest market. Yeah. I, yeah. The but, world's largest market. And when you when you when you have a open, when you get someone gives you the key to the world's largest market, you know, Indians are very, very good in business. <laughs> well, I mean, your family history is a good example. Your father came as a as a teenager, yeah. nothing on him. Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, the, the Indians are the most naturally competitive economic animals in the world. And Indians can compete with anybody. And you can't hide from China, you are right, because this year without RCEP, India has run up the highest deficit with China. In yes. fact, it's marginally more than all of India's defense budget, if that's a, that's a comparison. Yes. So, so I think, therefore, I think, you know, uh, I say this as a friend of India, you know, the, if India was to plunge into the ocean of globalization, there will be difficult adjustments in the beginning, okay? Some Indian industries will die, but that's what's called creative destruction. It's good to have creative destruction because new industries will come up. And you know something, the country that is, if I'm not mistaken, Producing the largest number of new startups now is India. Right. I'm not mistaken. So right. you, you are naturally competitive. And so you, are, you have the incredible opportunity today. And so, but you know, as you know, I'll be very blunt with you. Indian bureaucrats assume that they'll be, the Indians will be exploited by other countries coming into the big Indian market. Actually, it's the other way around. Indian businessmen can exploit opportunities in other markets. And, and so, and, and, and you know, all of us in Southeast Asia, this is a very important fact. If you look over the past 2000 years of history, Indian influence in Southeast Asia is much stronger than Chinese influence in Southeast Asia. Out of the 10 ASEAN countries, this is in my book, ASEAN Miracle, out of the 10 ASEAN countries, nine have an Indic base. 
Right. Only, only one has a scenic base, which is Vietnam. Yeah. And when President Tuhato, the leader of the world's largest Muslim country, wanted to uh, build a huge statue in the center of Jakarta, what did he do? He got a scene from the Mahabharata. Right? Right. So, you know, and, and when you go to the uh, Thai court, when they have the coronation ceremonies, they're Indian monks. So, you know, your, your influence in Southeast Asia is amazingly deep. 2000, this is a 2000 year deep well. So if you come back to Southeast Asia, if you join the RCEP, that's, that will be, create an incredible economic and cultural renaissance, which will be good for India and good for Southeast Asia. Well, that was beautifully said, uh, Kishore, and this has been a masterclass in international diplomacy and geostrategy. And I must say a very, uh, very original view, which is one, what one always expects from you. So as we speak, uh, we transmit this interview. Uh, we'll also share with our viewers and readers the titles of your books. Uh, you are a prolific author uh, and you take risks. Uh, talking about you are not on, you are not playing to a gallery, which is what makes you such a giant of an intellectual. So thank you very much for finding the time, Kishore. And I, we have, I think we need to get you into India for a few days on a lecture tour or something to pursue it. More Indians around this viewpoint. Happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kishore. The print of the cuff presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, corporate partner AU Small Finance Bank in alliance with Jindal Seal & Power Limited and Indraprastha Polo Hospitals, airline partner SpiceJet.